your mind is in every act, every action, every part of our lives, we utterly, desperately need the Lord. And we need His presence, we need His grace, we need His mercy, we need His love, we need His hope, we need His peace which surpasses all understanding. We need Him. And uh, just a good reminder this morning. Um, yeah, I need it. We all need it, right? So, let me open us today in prayer. To cry out. Father God, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Oh Lord, we need you right now. We need you because we as a community, as people, fall so short of your glory, of your grace. And Lord, sometimes we don't even know we need you because we think we are sufficient on our own. And in these moments, Lord, when we think we need nothing but, but ourselves, Lord, I pray that we are reminded of this Mind with your word and your truth that we need you above all things. Help us to move away from the things in this world that have defined us, that control us, that um, maybe even levy against us heavy weight and pressure and discouragement, maybe expectations, maybe it's failures, maybe it's discouragements, disillusionments, maybe it's heartbreak, maybe it's bitterness because you haven't answered, maybe it's because simply play world and throw some negative things in your life. And yet, Lord, we pray for each person gathered here that you are what we need, that you would meet us today, that you and your grace would come and be with us by your spirit. And Father, what a privilege it is to come and stand in your throne room. We don't have access to you, the infinite creator, not worshiping the created small things, but the infinite creator, that we can come in front of you and to you, to seek you, and to ask and say, we need you, and you hear us, Lord, and that you meet us where we are at. What a blessing that is this morning to be able to have that. Father, um, as I say that, I pray that for our community, but I myself need that as well. Oh, Father, may you help me to decrease as you mightily increase into our time today. As we speak about our second part of building our spiritual home, what does that look like? What does that mean? I pray, Father, that you would help our brothers and sisters be stirred by this timely reminder as we finish this really um, short summary in a sense of what it says in First Peter. And so, Father, we come and I give to you every person, however high as our lives have been or however lows our lives have been, Lord, you are there and you are good and you are faithful. You meet us in the highs and the lows and you are able to do all things. We commit each person to you. So, uh, as you guys know, we are in a two kind of two week series on um, sharing our theme of the year, which is um, in the Chinese side. It's uh, I'm not sure if you say it in Chinese, but it's building our spiritual home. The idea of building our spiritual home. Now, this is kind of an interesting one because what does that mean to build our spiritual home? It means that we are part of building something together in Christ. It also means that you are part of that process. That you all make up different components. It is also the question is that it is a process, that there is a timely journey that we are taking to build this together, and we are all part of this process. And so, um, with that said, I'm going to read us today, 1 Peter chapter 2, um, verses 4 through 10. Today we're covering 9 to 10, but we're going to cover the entire thing again, because this is our theme. Our theme is 4 to 9, but I just tagged on 10, because I, I like 10, it kind of flows well with it. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, and if you have... Your Blue Pew Bibles, it's in there, and it's on pages 1014 to 1015. Let's read it together, all right? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God. So last week we started to talk about First Peter. And Pastor Joey, what he did was, our first message was about the foundations. That what is our foundations of this spiritual home that we are going to build it upon? What is it supposed to be? And what he said was that each of us are a part of this journey, this process of building. That you each build and are a part of the roles to crafting this home. That we have been given this role. But not just that. And I'm summarizing very basically, so it's not going to... Totally, it's not going to do justice to Pastor Joey's message, but hopefully it does a little bit. But that our cornerstone, the foundation that holds it all together, it's Jesus. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. This, this is what we build everything on, is Jesus. And thirdly, that it is a process, that we are in a constant journey of construction. Right? There's never a time when we're actually finished right? until the word turns the right? We are still in a constant journey of right? remodeling, reshaping, recrafting. And lastly, that our calling then, as part of this, is to continue to daily imitate Christ. To live in Him, to live for Him, to reflect Him to the world around us. Okay? And that brings us then to today's text in 1 Peter, verses 9 to 10. And what I want to say is, Peter, as he writes this, there is not many texts like today's text. Because today's text is a very, I think it's a very beautiful text. It's like one of those gems, right? Like, if you ever want to ask, what is the church about? What is the church about? supposed to be its purpose, the calling of the body of Christ, this is a great text to refer to. It's one of the gems. You can always point to it and say, this is what the church is all about. And with Pastor Joey moving on, right, the transition, and with us in a, as a community kind of transitioning with him as he leaves well, it's going to be some time of figuring things out as a community. As we build the spiritual home, sans Pastor Joey, right? It's going to be hard. It's going to be a, a process of figuring out things, finding our new tolerances, new measurements and whatnot. And this is a very perfect time to explore what does it mean to continue to build our spiritual home, right? As we send Pastor Joey off to go build elsewhere, right, new homes. And I want us to think about that. Like, what is the church? Who are we? What are we called to do? Um, how are we called to be unique or distinctive in the world? How is this going to happen? And I was talking about this with uh, my girlfriend, and we were talking, and she's like, well, it's very easy to break the sermon into these three points. I was like, okay, it's so easy. <laughs> but essentially, uh, it was like, who, what, and she's like, I'm a teacher, so it's, you just ask questions like this. It's like, okay. Who, what, why? Who, what, why? Okay? But I'm going to, I had different style questions, but who, what, why is basically our format. Who is, who are, who, okay, who is we? But who and what are we to be? Okay? That's the church. My second point is, how are we or what makes us unique? What, how are we supposed to be distinctive? Lastly, um, why can we become like this? Why can we begin this? Well, how can this begin to happen in our lives? Okay. So I totally had a previous, I had a different way of answering asking questions, but she made it sound so much better with who, what, why, so I'm going with that. So um, that's our three points today. Okay? Who and what are we to be? How are we to be distinctive? And how is this going to start to happen? Uh, or why can we become like this? And I think this is a very big question for us as a church because um, every church should be asking these questions. But as the body of Christ, it's good to be re reminded what the church is called to be and how we as CFC can also reflect these qualities. So I'm sure many of you have read this. So I'm not going to like be saying much new stuff today. I think that I might just kind of look at it a little differently. But I think it's to encourage you to see how important we are called to be serving together. So what I would say first and foremost is who and what are we to be? In order for us to build this spiritual home as a church, each of you, including our youth here, or the kids here, the, the older brothers, the younger brothers, the older sisters, the younger or the older brothers too, every piece matters. And there is actually three things I think that we can learn and glean from this imagery of home and the idea of a temple. So I want to say that, that is this first image I want to kind of talk about is that we, as a body, are his temple. We are his priesthood. And if you read this, it's actually in Pastor Joey's section. It says, you come and you are like living stones. You build up a spiritual home 
to be a holy priesthood. And what do you do? You offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable God to God through Christ, through Jesus Christ. And what is that imagery? Is that we are, the, Christ is the foundation that holds us together, but the image is we are like the temple of God's. Okay? We are the body of God, the body of Christ. Right? And this holy priesthood, what we do is we offer sacrifices. Verse 5, right? So we are composing his temple, and we are the priests that minister in it. But what does that mean? What does that mean that we are the priesthood? And I want you to think about that for a second. If we are the temple of God as people, what does it mean that we are his priests? And it, what it means is this. You, when you know Christ, have access to God personally and his presence. Okay. You have access to God personally, and you are in His presence. You can come before. That's why when I pray with you guys, we are coming before the infinite God in His presence. Right? Why? Right? Because it's an imagery tied to where the Jewish people who would have read this would have understood that priests are available this access to God. Right? And the Jewish people understood this because they knew that there was a specific group of people that were uniquely called to serve as the caretakers of the temple, the priesthood. And so I would say you have an ultimate in with the infinite God. What does that look like? Well, it's like the best seats in a concert, right? It is like to meet the dignitary. You have the backstage super VIP pass, which I've never had, but if you had one, that'd probably be it, right? And to meet a famous person or something, right? It's that idea that you have such a ability to enter into the very personal presence of the infinite creator. And not only are we just called that we're priests, that we administer, but we're holy. What does that mean that we're holy? Right? And it's about bringing every part of your life, every aspect of your life into submission to God. That means you are holy at W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, His. That there's no part in your life that you cannot submit or give to God. I know there's a lot of us here. Okay, I'm like this too, so I'm not pointing fingers. Um, what we're good at, what we're strong at, we're, we're, there's no problem giving it to God, right? Right? But it's the ugly things that you're not proud of, the personal things that you're ashamed of, that you are embarrassed by. You don't want to work on them. Those things you don't want to give to God. And what he's saying here is that as we are priests that are holy, we are holy committed to every part of our life becomes committed to God, set apart for God. Right? What in your life then, is a question to think about, is not submitted to God as a priest. What is your part of life that you are a blind spot that you have not given to God? So that's my first insight I would offer to you guys, is that we are this temple, this priesthood. Okay? That means you are priests. Okay? It's not just Pastor Helga as a priest. You are also ministers of the gospel, which takes the workload off me a lot more if you guys think about it. Right? But you guys don't think that. But you often say, oh, Pastor Helga does it, Pastor Joey does this. But it's like, no, we're all priests. We're all ministers. We have all access to the presence of God, not just the exclusive. Okay? Second thing is that this is a kind of harder one, okay? I'm gonna, and this is I me mean, stretching a little bit, but I think it's true. You belong to something amazing. That you, for the first time when you know God, belong to one of the most awesome, greatest ever things that you could ever dare to hope to be a part of. Okay? That's how I word it down. Okay? That you, something that you are a part of right now is greater than anything you could ever be a part of in your life. Whatever job you have, even if you're at a great company, it's never going to match to that you are part of the greater work of God and His kingdom. Okay? You belong to something. And why do I talk about belonging? And what I'm going to say is this. Deep down in your life, if you think about it, in your life, you've always wanted to be part of something greater. You've always hoped to belong to something that gives you the greatest fulfillment and meaning and definition in your life. And when you haven't been able to find that in every layer of your life, you've been unsettled, you've been uncomfortable, you've never felt happy, you've never been truly at peace. And let me, let me give you how, how that happens, okay? It could be your hobbies, it could be your career, it could be your marriage, your relationships, it could be your pursuits. Anything in your life that you've sought to find some completeness in it, it never seems to fully satisfy. The married people here will tell you that too, right? You cannot expect your spouse to fulfill every uh, expectation and hope for you, right? 
you're going to get shattered, you're going to be broken, right? Um, for school, you went to college, you're not going to the best school, going to make your career set. But then you go to the job, and the job is horrible because your manager's horrible, right? You, it wasn't exactly what you expected, right? It never seems to be perfect. And why is that case? Because I think we're always coveting, we always are wanting to belong to something that will fulfill us truly. Every one of us, right? That's why when you desperately pursue after things all your life, you try to get into the right school, you try to be accepted by your classmates, by your peers at work, right? You try to be the cool person, you try to be in the in, right? You, you don't want to miss out the FOMO idea, the fear of missing out, right? At home, you want to be loved by your parents, you want to be accepted by them, you want to make sure that you've done the right things to please them. In society, you want to seem to be normal, not be weird, right? You want to look good enough, you want to look pretty enough, fashionable enough, you want to be accomplished enough, you want to be successful enough. At every layer of your life, why do you always feel the need to feel more complete? Why are you so dissatisfied? Why do you never feel like you truly are fulfilled or belong? And I would say it's because deep down, We've been struggling with this sense of belonging and fulfillment from the very beginning of the Bible. From the very beginning of Genesis, if you ever turn to the beginning, you read, when we were with God, everything was good. It was always good, right? But the moment Adam and Eve sins, the first Adam brings into this world the sin that corrupts our life. And that shuts us out of God's kingdom, God's garden. By being shut out of God's kingdom because of our sin, that's what separates us. That's what makes us always feel never fully seated in life, right? I'm not going to ask how many of us feel that way, but I just give you so many different permutations of that, right? So you can think about how you don't feel like you belong, right? That's why you're always trying to compensate. We're always trying to compensate. Maybe the way I'm dressing a certain way is to compensate. Maybe it's me getting this extra job to pay off some things, extra curricular activity to get more fit, maybe. Maybe it's the diet I'm on, maybe the fashion I'm trying to emulate. What are you trying to, why are we trying to compensate, to impress, to get, be accepted, to get in? And I would say, it's because at every layer of your life, you struggle with this. You struggle with this fulfillment and belonging since the garden, okay? And it's because of our sin. And then here's where I'm gonna say something that's kind of weird that you guys might not understand, but some of you will, okay? I would say that, because most of us here are minorities, Right, minority culture in the U.S. We all kind of understand we don't belong in some form. Okay, let me give you an example. There's a book by uh, Beverly Tatum about, uh, it's about why did the colored kids sit on the other side of the cafeteria? I think that's how it's quoted. And one of the things she says is that you can always find a layer where you don't belong. You actually read, you look into your life. For example, um, let's we'll talk about our sisters here, our women here. That you are in a reality of this world where often you are excluded and there is injustice because of your gender. That this still happens in our world. There is a sense of a gender, there's some sort of ceiling that limits you career-wise and role-wise, right? This, many of you have faced this, you've encountered it maybe even like subtly. Now there's also, of course, racial, right? But there's also for us men here, we just have to think one step forward. Asian men, right? That's already had sometimes at a disadvantage in careers and being passed for jobs, right? There is always, it seems, societal surface level reasons that are broken that we don't belong. You can always find it in your life. But I would invite you to understand, if you only think surface, you're not thinking deeper. Your sense of not belonging is not just because the political system has failed you, because culture has failed you, because our society is not fair or just. It's because you and I, from day one, have been separated from God because of our sin. That is why we don't feel like we belong. It may be a surface level reason that we see in our lives, but deep down, it's because we are separate from God. We from God. And what I'm trying to say today is that when you become a believer, when you become a part of the body of Christ, you don't have to try anymore. I'm not saying that you shouldn't fight against injustices, but you belong to the infinite God. You are his priests. You are his people. And that means you have a personal access to his relationship with him. And what separates us is our sin. It's so filthy, so unworthy to come before a perfect God. But Jesus, because he's our cornerstone, has created into us this access to him, this relationship with him. Okay. And you gotta understand how exclusive the temple was. The temple was for a specific group of family of Jewish men who had to have practiced such a holy life to get in. Right? If you had any disability, 
this physical perfection, you're a female, you're of a different culture, different gender, different race, you couldn't get in. But you and me have access to the infinite God, God and His glory because of Jesus Christ. That's an incredible access you have. Okay? My last insight I want to share with you is this. If you think about it, you are the temple of God and it's the imagery of the Jewish culture. God's glory then resides with us. You get what I'm saying? That in the innermost part of the temple, the Jewish temple, only a few could go before God's glory shine forth. God's infinite beauty, majesty, His presence, His Shekinah glory was there. Right? Even Moses, who couldn't be directly facing, he had to have a cloud of fire and clouds. To, if he wanted to see God, he couldn't even see Him directly. Right? God had to pass Him by, in a sense, and cover Him. Right? So you could just catch a back end glimpse of Him in passing. And what I would say is God's glory is so uncontainable, so infinitely beautiful, so amazing, it bursts forth like a light into this world. And it's interesting because in Jesus, when he dies on the cross, the, the curtain is torn in Matthew 27, and it says from the top down, right, that the curtain, God has ripped the curtain apart, so his glory shines forth into the world. And I think when you read the story of Israel, often you see is that people of Israel assume that the glory of God, this presence of God, this exclusiveness, was meant just for them. But rather, it was meant to be not contained, it was meant to be for others. That the Jewish people were meant to be an example to point others to God, right? And when you start to understand this, when you as a church, or as we as a church, start to understand that we are carrying this fire, this glory of His, we, we display it in our lives, that it works not just as, in us as people, individually, but it shows by the way we are as a church, as a community. Okay? And that's why we need each other. Why we need each other to love. We need each other to see our strengths. We need each other to see our weaknesses, our gifts, our flaws. Right? Because you can't live your faith alone. You can't live it alone. You can't even live it alone as a human being. It's not healthy. Right? But let alone be in your Christian faith. Be alone. If there's something profoundly amazing that you belong to that is powerful, that is greater than just you, it's, it's all of us. And it gives us hope. It gives us accountability. It glorifies God. And something magical happens in that. Not just magical. Tremendously amazing. And it explodes into this world the way we love each other, and the way it explodes out of our lives, and how we live and talk to people, and how we have this whole perspective that's different. Okay? And I think it's interesting that Pastor Joey said countercultural. It is countercultural. It's actually even more than countercultural. Right? Counterculture sounds like a singular culture. It's actually world changing. Okay? And so, if that's who we are insightfully, what we are to be, then what are the distinctivenesses of our culture, of us as people? What makes us unique in, in this perspective before God? And this, I would take us to the second part, which is, um, how are we distinctive? What makes us unique? And what Peter does here is he lays three ways that we are very unique, okay? Actually, there's more ways, but I'm just going to go three. Um, first one is chosen race. Chosen race. Second one, holy nation and a people for his own possession. And I'll, re I'll come back to the royal priesthood because we kind of talked about it already, but we'll revisit it at the end. But you are a chosen race, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. What does that mean? And what I would first say as a chosen race is that we, because of the work of Christ, because of the blood of Christ, now are not multi-ethnically, um, just different cultures trying to be, we are a shared people in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ makes us a common race now. It doesn't matter what other races you were before. You are a unique race made up of the shared identity in the blood of Christ. Okay? And what does that mean? That's a, is, first of all, so next slide, the chosen is a race. Okay? I want to focus on that for the first part. Right? It's not about your history, it's not about your family connections, it's not about your accomplishments. It doesn't matter even what race background you are from. I'm not saying I'm dismissing it, but that you now are a new people. Okay? But the second thing it says is it says chosen. And I think that's a very interesting chosen race. What it means is you have nothing to do with being chosen. You have nothing to do with it. A person that knows God and has given their life to God understands that as you are a part of God's people, it's not because of your effort. It's not because of what you've done, your accomplishments, your success. Everything rests on the identity that has been given to you in the blood of Christ. Okay? And that sounds, I could say that sounds a little bit, like, a little exclusive, right? But if you think about that, it's not as exclusive as it is. Actually, it's more open and exclusive. 
How? Um, and I would say it's not choice, right? It's not select, right? It's not that you're elite, you're physically a specimen. It's not based around the fact that you're more beautiful, more gifted, more talented, more wealthy that gets you into the kingdom. If anything, it's God's initiative to choose you. It's outside of your ability to prove yourself. You see that? And so, no, it's not that you are a choice. It's a choice that only the best people get in. It's because you have been given a gift by God. You've been chosen. Okay? And that leads me to my second thought. It's a holy nation. What does that mean, a holy nation? Um, it means to be set apart as a people. As a, as a, as a nation, as a country. Okay? That means, if you think about it, like our, when you go to another country, every culture has a very distinctive feel, right? Thinking, style of doing things, their banking systems are different, maybe even the currency is different, even their habits, their music tastes are different. Everything's different about them. When you are a holy nation, what does it mean? It means that you are a new, we are like almost like imposing a new kingdom, a new country perspective on things. And I was thinking about this, and I, I, some of the guys here know this, we are really the cars, right? And I was literally talking about this with my brother yesterday morning. But we are so into cars sometimes that we can talk about cars. We, 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 we get the jokes about certain things. We understand that the new ideas are coming out. We, we get the, the history about racing. We have humor about like, things that don't go right with manual transmissions versus the automatic transmissions, blah, blah, blah. Right? But for most of you, you're like, who cares? It's, so, it's weird, right? It's like, that's not even, I don't understand that. But that subculture really shapes the way we, 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 we see things. All right? And what I would say today is when you're a holy nation, you're not just this unique subculture, Christian culture, okay? But it changes the entirety of all that you do, your tastes, your values, your money value, the way you look at money, the way you look at people, the way you look at future, the way you look at success, the way you look at your family. Every layer of your life, every aspect, socially, economically, culturally, religiously, politically, you're not from this world anymore. So you have a whole different way of looking at things. That's what a holy nation means. And the last thing, okay, and this is going to take me, okay, or into kind of a, a oh, I'm not sure, but what does that mean for us today to be a holy nation? Let me give you some ideas for that, okay? If you are a holy nation and you have all these ways of seeing things, then you can't compartmentalize your faith. Your faith cannot just be a part, a small part of your life. It has to be in every part of your life. It's not about you self-improving and segmenting your faith. Not about self-betterment. This one uh, is not about mama mentality. Sorry, Kobe, right? It's not just a resource and you add a, a skill set to your life because it's about your entire life. How do you deal with your entire life, right? How do you think? How do you function? How do you operate? How do you process? You have to see that it involves everything about you. Your entire life should be shaped by the gospel. That's what I'm saying. Right? The way you look at your kids, the way you raise them, the way you do your job, the way you are a husband or a wife, the way you work as, a, as an employee or as a boss, as a teacher maybe, whatever career you're in, how you save your money, how you spend your money, every aspect or every complexity of your life, every permutation of this, you know, whatever you do should have the gospel infused into that perspective. That's what it means to not compartmentalize. Okay? And the second thing is then you, at the same time, you can't compartmentalize your faith. You cannot let the world corrupt this understanding of the gospel. It's not letting the world's way then define everything you do. It's first letting God's word define what you do. Right? Because you were once a people in darkness, but now you receive Right? You were called out of darkness into this light. Once you were people who didn't have mercy, right? But now you have mercy. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? Okay. It takes so much work to do this. Building a spiritual home is not quick. Just like any home you build, unless you're in China, that's not different. They build pretty fast there. But if you're here, um, it's work. It's a constant process. Because it takes it takes so much time to build relationships with people. To not misunderstand each other, not to hate each other, to love one another, 
There's so many moments in your life, my life, that we trigger each other, right? So many opinions, so many differences, so many reasons for us to not agree with each other. There's so many complexities, self-interest motivated historically because we were like hurt sometime in our past, right? And the world constantly pressures us with different perspectives. So for us to be unified as a church, to overcome all these differences is tremendous, tremendous work. It takes time. And that's why the gospel is so powerful, because it needs to be into every part of life. So as you're transforming, it infuses into everything you do as well. How you talk to people. When you when you fail your brother, you confess. You confess, you love them, you apologize, you initiate, you serve them. Right? It takes time, it takes word, it takes the, the it takes the word of God infusing into every aspect, new cranny of your life, your relationships, your community, your 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 sub, your, your fellowship and your submission to others, your accountability, prayer, confession. So much work. And that's what it looks like to be the holy nation, to have it truly infuse you. And this last thing leads me to this interesting one, which is he says, You are distinctively a people for his own possession. A people for his own possession. It means this that you are God's very own precious possession. You may not feel precious today, you may not feel whole today, but what he says here is that you are so precious to him. Okay? Maybe you feel like you don't deserve this, but I want to say you are so precious. Right? What is, think about it for a moment, what is something that right now, if there was a fire or an earthquake or some calamity that happens, what is the first thing that you will desperately seek to save in your life? What is the first thing? Now, for parents here, I'm sure it's your child, right? For some of us, it's like some item in our house or a, a car or toy, right? What is that thing that you cannot let go of, that you feel like you need to protect it? That is your precious possession. That is your precious possession. And I'll give you an example. My uncle, my, my dad's older brother, is a huge tea set collector in Taiwan. Big, like, he collects tea sets. He has like more tea sets than he ever needs because he has like probably more than like 10, right? And these tea sets, there's one of them. One of them is like from the Ming dynasty. So it's like priceless, okay? So when there was an earthquake in town, we, we laughed about this as a family. Uh, he ran to the living room and to his cupboard, and he held the cupboard as the earthquakes happened. <laughs> that was more important to him than his kids in the other room. He was like, whoa, 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 gotta hold this thing. I don't want to shatter it. We'll survive the earthquake, but this thing is my precious possession. Okay, and why did he feel like he needed to protect it, to guard it? Because that was so priced, so important. You, we as a church, is, this is how God sees us. We're so precious. He loves us. He cares for us. More than any created thing on this creation of earth, He loves you and me. That's how precious we are. Why? Because of Christ. Because the righteousness that comes through Christ. We are so loved. We are so precious. Do you realize the magnitude, the extent that God would go to save you because you're so Christ. And this leads me to my last point, which is why can we be so distinctive? Why can we be so different? Why can we start to become this church? Why can we become like this temple where the glory just bursts forth, is infectious, that moves and empowers the world, changes the world? Why can we be this? And it leads me to my last verse. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And what I want to understand, I didn't know this, okay? I was reading it recently. I was studying the commentary. And it says, this verse alludes, Peter is quoting and pointing at a famous text in the Old Testament. He's quoting, in a sense, Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Hosea chapter 2, verse 23 says this. I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And you shall say, you are my God. Now, what is that from? What is the story of Hosea? Now, if you were in the youth group salt shakers, we talked about this. So you should remember this. Okay? You were there. That means you also should be there. right? But that's another story. But um, what is the story of Hosea? The story of Hosea that's being quoted is a story of a prophet right, who is, in a sense, declaring to his people... They're sinning against God. Reminding them that, look, you have betrayed God. And his whole life becomes a 
a testimony, an accusation, a criticism of the people of Israel. Let me give you how he did it. Okay, so Hosea is this prophet. He's just chilling. Okay, this is totally butchery of it, right? He's chilling, and God says, hey, marry this lady named Gomer. And you're like, uh, okay. So he marries this woman named Gomer. He falls madly in love with, I'm guessing, but Gomer is unfaithful. She's an adulteress. She cheats on him. Not just cheats on him. She cheats on him multiple times, it seems. And what happens is she ends up leaving him. But before she leaves him, they end up having kids. And his kids' names are like Jezreel, no mercy, not my people. Like, he doesn't even know they're his kids. Okay? He doesn't even know, and she ends up leaving him. Okay? And what happens in the story of Hosea, which is so incredible, is if you read just the first four chapters of Hosea, that's, you get so much meat from that three, four chapters. Hosea, somehow Gomer is on her own, doing her own thing, and somehow... Whatever background she had, she ended up becoming mistreated and abused, and maybe falling even into debt, and she's sold into slavery. So she's in slavery, she's in a market, and she can't pay her debt, so she's stuck. She's enslaved. And Hosea goes and restores her, he buys her back. He sacrifices, he buys her back, and brings her home for her to reconcile and be part of his family. You know? And this imagery, it might not seem so powerful to you, but it's the story of how God loves his people. And God is using this image of Hosea's life to say to us that we are like Gomer, that the people of Israel was like Gomer, that they have strayed, they betrayed him, they, they're sleeping around with other idols, with other gods. And today we talk about idolatry. Through our sin, we've separated ourselves. We keep choosing the world's ways. And God's desperately calling for us because he loves us. He wants us to come home. And you are so prized, such a precious possession. He has to move the world, change the world in such a powerful way to save you and me. Because the problem with sin is not a finite problem. It's an infinitely deep, difficult problem. Not an infinite problem, but it's a very infinitely, close to infinitely deep problem. And so the only way is through Christ. And so God keeps his promises. Right? Though you turn, though I turn, though we run away from him, but we betray his love daily. He pursues us. He loves us. He buys us back from our sins. In Christ he restores us. Have you ever, personal question, have you ever been rejected by someone you love? Have you ever been broken, like uh, broke up with someone? Have you ever been betrayed in such a way that it almost felt like your innards were really ripped out? Okay, maybe not. That's visual. But um, it's agonizing. It's agonizing that you're heartbroken. Anybody here who's been heartbroken knows how betrayed, how brokenhearted it feels. It tears you apart. And that's just a glimpse. That's such a minute, because in your grand now you're with someone else or you're happy now. And you're like, oh, I was over it. But in that moment, your life felt like nothing. Everything felt like it was coming out, right? You couldn't hold it anymore. You're just so broken. And yet God is still came to chase save us. That's how much he loves us. You cannot understand how much God loves you until you understand how much you betrayed him and broke his heart. When you understand how much you hurt him, it's only then you start to understand how much he loves you. And that's why when you look at the story of Jesus and you hear the gospel, don't casually ignore it. Realize Jesus willingly endured such great suffering to save you and me. And we keep turning away from him. We keep escaping him. We keep following after other idols, like adultery. Like, like, it's like adultery. And he pursues us, he loves us, that he would go and die on the cross for you and me. And he would shed his blood so that we would consider his once and for all. This is why you and I can daily become the spiritual home. This is why we can become the temple. We can become the priesthood, the chosen race, the holy nation. It's because God's love has redeemed you and me. So we have purpose. It takes me to my last thought. And this last thought, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go fast because I have less time now. I'm sorry. How do we do it? How do we move forward? If you read this text, there's another layer. There's another layer inside. Okay. I, I, th I think it's interesting. Because it's interesting, it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. It means that you have royalty in your blood. Right? You are a holy nation, 
and your people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. What I'm saying here is this, you have been given purpose to proclaim his excellencies. How do we go, what does that mean to proclaim? Okay. And what I would say today moving forward is this, we as the church are a temple, a priesthood. That means we're static, right? We're static, we're building, we're, we're in place, right? But the people, the church isn't the building, it's actually the people of God. So wherever we go, where two or more of us gather, we are in such the church. So we're not only static, we are also in movement. We are dynamic. We can enter spaces. We can fit everywhere. You see that? And the crazy thing is, you have a role that's far greater than just being a priest. You are a priesthood of believers. But you are also prophets. And I don't mean like prophets that you go out and like make money, but you know, it's that you are like, it's that you can courageously declare God's truth. What does that look like? Because it says you're proclaiming. That word proclaiming is as though you are proclaiming as a prophet. Speak the truth, right? Prophets declare God's truth. Priests, by serving, by loving, by compassion, by ministering, they bring people to God. So you're a prophet. You're a priest. And you are also royalty. You are like a king and a queen because you are shaped by Jesus' blood. You are royalty. So we proclaim the excellencies as his child children, royalty. We are also priests. We are also prophets. You know how tremendous our promise and statement that is? That wherever we go, we can shine glory, bring God's fire and glory to a place. That's it. An incredible imagery. Powerful. Any change you see in this church, it's because of God working. Not because of you, me. Not because of a good sermon. Not because of a good Bible study. Not because of a, you had a feel good moment for a moment and you feel on fire. No, it's because God's glory is beside you and displaying His glory. That's not me and you. But when we start this, we start to do it for Him. We are, in a sense, His hands and feet to do this to the world, bring this to the world. What a, what a great role we have been called to be a part of. And so, as we close this, 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 um, this two sermon, short sermon net series on. First Peter on building our spiritual home. I want you to think about that. I don't know what I just said today. About how we are as people. Now you are something unique. You are something tremendous. You are distinct. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, once we were not a people, but we now are your people, God's people. Once we hadn't received mercy, but now you and I have received mercy by the of your grace. Oh, Father, I pray that my brothers, my sisters, friends gathered here to see how tremendous of an opportunity and of a privilege of being part of something so awesome, so wonderful, so great it is to be a part of your work. That CFC as a home is one of many churches, but we are part of the greater church that is you. And yet, wherever we gather, we are your temple, your priests. Wherever we go, we are your temple, your priests. We're not just priests, we're not just royalty, because we are beloved by you. Not only that, but we are also called to declare your truths. Oh, Father, I pray that we would continue to do that in our lives. May we continue to live for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor Paul Khan. Um, if we all please rise, we'll go ahead and close with the doxology.
created us to be. It may be for our continued growth and growth in the good of this church body, Lord, but also for the blessing of those around us, those that do not know you. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Go in the peace and the grace of the Lord and exit, please exit through the front door. Amen.